Now, um, I think we're going through a time where companies out there are facing a lot and increasing pressures, whether it's about being responsible towards the environment, being responsible towards their employees, behaving ethically, um, responsibility towards the local communities in which they operate, and also re responsibility towards uh, their customers. And we see these events in the news all the time. Consider, for instance, the horrific events in the US this week with the shooting at, uh, at the Parkland High School. What happened? A number of companies immediately started cutting ties with the NRA, right? But all, clearly not all companies respond in the same way. You have Delta Airlines that cuts ties and says, I'm not going to give the group discounts to NRA anymore. And what happened? The lieutenant governor of Georgia says, well, you know, I'm a Republican. I support the NRA. I'm going to work against uh, your tax credits. Quite literally. So the, the issue is complicated, right? And then on the other hand, you have FedEx that comes up with this uh, interesting position that says, um, you know, we do support uh, the Second Amendment. We do support no, you know, military weapons in schools. I mean, you know. Uh, and then a global boycott starts on Twitter about, you know, you, you should use UPS and any other uh, um, uh, company that, as an alternative rather than using FedEx. So although they try to take this great position where, you know, we do support the rights, but we are also going to keep the ties with the NRA, suddenly sparks a global boycott, right? So in other words, there's a lot of uh, pressures and increasing expectations about accountability and, and, and in, way that, in the ways that the firm, uh, a company, engages with not just its own shareholders, but also with the broader world and what we would describe as its uh, stakeholders. So you can imagine though this, this creates a lot of difficult challenges, often conflicting expectations across the different stakeholders. And it builds it up really important questions. How do I understand who my material stakeholders are? Are. How do I integrate, to the extent that I want to be responsible, how do I integrate these policies and in these initiatives of responsibility into the way I do business? Because often out there you hear this uh, you know, big uh, kind of words that say, oh, responsibility needs to be in the DNA of the organization. And then you ask them, well, what exactly is the DNA of the organization? And that's typically when you get a lot of blank faces, right? Um, but we do, I mean, as we do research, we do know a lot more about what it means to embed these practices. Now, one, I think, uh, critical um, trend in this uh, uh, you know, quest for more accountability is the fact that the powerful institution out there, which we call the capital market, it's waking up to the fact, slowly but steadily, it's waking up to the fact that companies are going to be evaluated not only on their financial performance, but also on what we call the ESG, the environmental, their social and their governance performance. And that's a big change of hearts, particularly if you consider, again, the last couple of months when the CEO of BlackRock, BlackRock being, being the largest uh, asset manager in the world, uh, managing about $6.77 trillion uh, worth of assets, that comes out there and says, you know what, if you're a company that only generates financial uh, performance, basically you're not safe. You need to explain to the world and you need to explain to the, your shareholders to what extent do you also have a positive social impact, positive social and environmental impact. And there's a big push on the market, uh, um, as, as we'll see a bit later on, not just from BlackRock, Vanguard followed suit, Fidelity did as well, Morningstar is issuing ratings that also integrate environmental, social and governance issues. We have investors that invest heavily in AI technologies in order to read this data and make sense of this da non-financial data and then derive their investment decisions. So a lot is happening and a lot of push is happening, if you like, from perhaps one of the most powerful uh, modern institutions that we have. Now let's take a step back though. The question is, why now? Why is it that this ESG or this sustainability, these responsibility issues are coming to the forefront now as opposed to let's say 10 or 20 years ago? Why do you think that the companies are facing those pressures now? This is what I would like to hear from you. So, <laughs> I spoke for my first five, 10 minutes. So what do you think? Why now? Why are companies facing these pressures now? I think we have a microphone as well somewhere. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. 
I think uh, companies have become quite more transparent uh, yes. in what to do um, fr from the external perspective, but also employees talking more about the employers. Right, right. So employees talk about more of their employers. And, and we, we know, and probably you guys know better than I do, that especially when it comes to new hires and recruiting of talent from the younger generations, we are, we are seeking this alignment of purpose. Right? It does matter to me if I go to a mining company that, uh, if I work for a mining company that at the end of the mine is going to leave a devastated economy and a huge hole in the ground. Right? It matters to me if that company is going to use dirty coal and, and market it into the, uh, into the economy. It matters to me the impact that I have through my work. So, uh, um, you know, citizens as employees have a huge, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a huge impact on how companies think about these issues. Yes, sir. There's an NGO called Blueprint that I came across. and they're, they're, Blueprint they're, for Better Business. Yeah, yep. and, and, and they talk about the, the wide gap between the outputs of organizations and the benefit to society. Right. I think the scrutiny is coming from not people objecting to ma people making money, they always have, yeah. but the belief that they're making money at the expense of society rather than to the benefit of it. So the advantage, yeah, for example, healthcare products stop us dying from routine illness. We don't mind people making money out of that, right. withholding healthcare products right, 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 right. To, exactly. to maximize or the, 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 the value of another drug. Right. Not happy about or that. Or not, not uh, developing drugs for, you know, uh, diseases that are considered unprofitable, right? Um, absolutely. So there's this sense of, of, of responsibility, uh, if you like, that comes also from the, from the customer side. It comes from social expectations. Become, perhaps it comes from the fact that we, uh, as society, because of the social media and so on, we, we're building a collective awareness, right? You don't treat your employees well. Right, a, a, a someone undercover with a, uh, with a hidden camera that's about uh, it's about this big can suddenly expose you, right? So the risk of, and or you're mistreating animals from that for that matter, or you have slave labor, or you use children in your supply chain. Those are so easily revealed and so easily shared. Suddenly, you create a collective identity. It matters to me if the clothing that I'm wearing today was produced in something like the Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh that collapsed and killed 3,000 people. It matters to me if the electronic devices that I'm using right, have components for Foxconn that was forced to install fishing nets around its buildings to prevent people from jumping to their death. Right? It matters, and we know about it. Right? Um, <coughs> well, the reverse is true. So the, what we know is that um, these boycotts are actually very uh, intelligently targeted. So they, they do go for companies that, for which uh, they're more likely to have an effect. Right? But we also know that um, actually some research that I'm doing on, let's say, forget about uh, uh, boycotts, something even more subtle. Let's say a company that um, says more than it does on, let's say, green product innovation, right? Can we detect if those companies are hit by lower customer satisfaction when they try to, let's say, being strategically hypocritical? And the answer is yes. You can find a very a systematic um, uh, uh, negative impact on customer satisfaction. And you know for which companies this is particularly true? For the companies that monitor customer satisfaction. And why is that the case? Because if you're a customer and I come as a company and I ask your opinion, right, and then on top of that I lie to you, right, I'm adding in insult to the injury. If you're going to lie to me, why are you asking me anyway, right? Um, so fascinating things are happening on the customer front. But yeah, we do have at least some, uh, you know, accumulating evidence that it, it, it matters negatively. Um, now, why... I mean, so there's a number of, of, of reasons, but I think... The way I would like to, I, I typically think about this is as, as using my favorite Spider-Man code that says that with great power comes great responsibility. You've seen the Spider-Man movie? Uh -huh. There we go. <laughs> so what does that mean? Why is, are these expectations on companies growing? Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you think about this for a second. There's this NGO called Global Justice Now. And Global Justice Now uh, ranked, let's say, the 100 largest economic entities around the world. Okay. Now, uh, that includes companies as well as countries. So if I were to ask you, out of the 100 largest economic entities around the world, how many of them are companies and how many of them are countries? What, we, what would be your best guesstimate? 70 companies. 70 companies? Did you see the numbers before? 
Okay. <laughs> 50, 50, 60. It's actually 69 um, out of the top 100 are actually companies. 69 of the, of the largest 100 economic entities around the world are companies as opposed to countries. And it's, it's pretty dramatic, right? Because now we, we discussed about how can we bring governments together to, to deal with climate change and so on. And we do think typically of governments and countries as more powerful, but I think it's important to also keep in mind that economic activity, and in fact, sometimes the concentration of economic activity is increasingly going into the world's, uh, run by the world's largest companies. I mean, the, the, the numbers are staggering. If you take the world's top 10 corporations in terms of their revenue and add them up, so they're world's top 10 corporations combined are larger than the world's bottom 180 countries, according to these numbers. And in fact, if you take other measures, for, for instance, the concentration of economic activity by, let's say, the, the world's top 1,000 companies, uh, one of my co-authors has done some math on that, and basically what you find is that over the decades, starting from 1980, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, is that the concentration is higher and higher, and uh, in the 2000s, we're talking about 80% of the, of the OECD GDP actually being produced by um, uh, the, the world's 1,000 companies. So the concentration of economic activity, which obviously leads to larger size, makes this effect of business and society much more prominent. Whether we talk about environmental damage, whether we talk about the impact in the community, whether we talk about the number of people they employ and their impact on, on employment and people's well-being and so on and purpose at work, all those things uh, in, 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 in very concrete ways actually uh, get exaggerated or amplified by the size of, of companies. And that's precisely why you see companies like Unilever, for instance, right, coming out and responding to these pressures, uh, to these expectations by saying, you know what, um, the purpose of Unilever is to make sustainable living commonplace. They have ambitious, I mean, think about for a company to say, you know, I would like to improve the well-being of more than one billion people on this planet. It's quite an ambitious statement, right? To, to, to come out and respond to these demands and expectations in this way. And this is a company that could potentially achieve this if the right institutions, the right incentives, the right, right people perhaps are in place. Because Unilever is a company that reaches 2.5 billion people on the planet daily, daily, through its products and services. But Unilever is not alone. If you take, for instance, um, this KPMG um, study, so they looked at this idea of corporate disclosures. In other words, they looked at whether companies issue a sustainability or a CSR report. And what you see is that uh, over time, clearly there's an increasing trend. There's 90, 93% is um, for the global, uh, global 250 companies, the uh, largest 250 companies, right? 93% um, of them are actually putting out sustainability reports which complement their financial disclosures. So, they, they, in other words, they, they disclose their non-financial information. But also, if you take uh, a cross-section of, say, 49 countries around the world, and you see within each country the top 100 companies, you also see an increasing trend. And basically, uh, up to last year, three-quarters of them around the world were also issuing a sustainability report. In other words, this increasing demands and for accountability and, and transparency, as, as you mentioned earlier, are really biting in the sense that companies are responding and they are issuing these, response, uh, these uh, reports out there, trying to tell the world, and in particular to tell their stakeholders and increasingly their shareholders, how is it that they're managing these intangibles? Because at the end of the day, a large chunk of financial reporting is backward looking. Right? It doesn't tell you much about things like employee morale, commitment, engagement. Right? To what extent is the, your purpose as a company aligned with your employees and so on. Now the interesting next step though is that uh, although a number of companies issue this differentially between sustainability reports and financial reports, a number of them actually integrate, start increasingly integrate these issues into their financial reports. Because the, the, kind of highlighting the idea that these are two sides of the same coin. You cannot manage your intangibles or your environmental and social governance impact irrespective of your business model. Right? There might be things that you can do, so, like you know, uh, philanthropic. 
uh, uh, contributions, you know, Friday afternoon, let's go paint a wall at the local school. That's all good and fine. But if we start talking about more um, strategic integration of these challenges, then companies are realizing that are their core to what they're doing. Hence why they're more inclined over the years to, uh, to start talking about these issues into their financial disclosures. And sometimes it might be regulation driven, right? Think about SEC filings in the US. SEC filings tell you that you have to report on anything that is material from a business point of view. Well, these issues are clearly material for a lot of sectors, a lot of industries, and a lot of companies, hence why they find their way into, um, into financial reporting. Now, the fact, though, that increasingly there is this understanding about integration of these environmental and social expectations to business also takes us to this, what I would call a redefinition of what we mean by sustainability, right? Because we, we teach executives that, you know what, you know, when you do strategy, when you build an organization, it's all about your superior performance. It's all about your competitive advantage, your sustainable competitive advantage, right? Um, but if one starts accounting from, for these environmental, social, governance, ethical pressures that they're facing, the sustainability, the definition of what is a sustainable advantage changes radically. Because remember what the, the CEO of BlackRock said, is, he said, it's not enough to just produce financial performance. You also need, in a sense, to generate environmental and social impact and then positive impact at that. Which, this is precisely the reason why I think that these issues, these challenges, these expectations are probably one of the most important mega trends, but also one of the most important challenges that management is going to face going forward. Because these are issues that were often ignored. If environmental issues were not ignored, we wouldn't have climate change problems today. Right? These are new domains of responsibility that either because of regulation, either because of expectations, either because of demands by the different and diverse stakeholders, every executive has to deal them one way or another. And you can see that, you know, there is, there is the efficiency way of dealing with this and say, you know what, I'm going to just do what the law says and I'll be fine. And there's others that say, well, wait a second, uh, you know, if this is a problem, it might be looking for a solution. Can I see these problems as potentially profitable opportunities? Right? That's why you see these more innovative, perhaps radical business models coming on the horizon, like circular economy, the idea of redesigning designing your products such that at the end of their economic life, you get them back, you disassemble them, and using the same resources, you build the next generation of products so that you don't deplete the uh, the planet's resources, right? Because, you know, you can do this easy back of the envelope cal calculations, and I'm pretty sure you have, you guys have read them, uh, but here's, here's one that's particularly worrisome on the resource point of view. Um, we're, we're projecting, right, that by 2050, there will be about eight and a half, nine billion people on this planet, right? And, we're, and, you know, if we account for things like technolog technological innovation and efficiency and so on, one can ask the question, how many resources would we need in 2050 in order to maintain the human development, uh, uh, the growth in human development that we, uh, have to, we enjoy today? The answer is rather unfortunate. According to some calculations, it's two and a half planets. Problem is that we only have one, <laughs> you know? Hence why these more radical ideas come in, but only to highlight that it's not just about how you do these efficiency initiatives, it's how you really integrate what you do into your business model, how do you embed it, if you like, in the organizational DNA, but at the end of the day, how you do that in a way that is synergistic in the business model. You're not doing this as a philanthropic, uh, nothing wrong with philanthropic actions, but if you want to talk about the sustainability of the business in the long run, the question becomes, how do I do this in a way that enables me to generate more financial performance and therefore survive and thrive, but at the same time, I do uh, I, 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 um, um, sustainable financially while also being sustainable in the environmental and social sense. And that's why I told you earlier that I think this is the biggest trend that we're, we're seeing, in my view, at least in management, but also the biggest challenge because these are inherently difficult issues. They have to do with factors that in, this, in the past we perhaps not being able to measure and understand as well compared to financial factors. We all know what the cost of goods sold means. Well, good luck finding a unifying measure of employee engagement across all companies and industries and measure it in a way that an investor can make a financial decision in it. 
Should we? Of course we should. Are we there yet? No, we're not. But financial reporting, do you know how many years it took for our standards to become financial standards? So when you say profit or EBITDA or cost of goods sold or whatever it is, uh, you, we mean the same thing across industries? It took about 100 years right, to go to, to auditing standards. And, I mean, let's be honest, right? Those are more simpler issues compared to the underlying environmental social uh, challenges um, and engagement challenges that we're facing. But that's, that's the core of this, right? Because these challenges make this an opportunity because if this was easy things to do, everyone would have done it. There's no way to create an advantage out of it, right? It's, I always enjoy reading these articles out there that says, oh, the five things you can do to make your company sustainable, right? Or the three steps to making your company sustainable and so on. Yeah, you know, they might do for, it might be a fun reading on a train ride, but you know, if you're gonna change an entire organization to be responsible, it's not that easy. And my favorite one is, you know, many times say, oh, if you're a CEO and you speak to your employees or speak to your local communities, I'm sure there are win-win situations. So it's about going out and doing the win-wins. It's like, if there are win-wins and you haven't done them yet, you're probably, you're not a good CEO, right? <laughs> The question is, what happens when I face trade-offs? What happens when, for example, to produce a green product is more expensive than a brown product, right? In other words, to meet environmental credentials, I'm gonna end up with a product that perhaps people are not gonna buy. What, when I have that trade-off, how do I resolve it? That's a not win-win, but I'm still gonna face those pressures. Well, that's what management is about, right? You can just say, well, actually, that's not sustainable. I'm just gonna do the green and expensive. And, you know, the consumers are going to buy it. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, um, do, do you guys know this statistics on the customer side? This is my favorite statistic to cite because let's say we run surveys with the, our customers, right? And we tell them, would you buy the green product or would you buy the brown product if all else was the same? What do they say? Of course I'm going to buy the green. I mean, who do you think I am buying the, you know, the filthy brown product, right? So you get this crazy like 97, 98% saying, of course we're going to buy the green. Now, then you get some, you know, uh, academics working in the background and they put these choices in front of them, right? And they do some more empirical studies and more rigorous studies. And, you know, when nobody's looking, when you do have the choice, what do people do? Yeah, of course they do. So I mean, even if it's if it's, uh, it's the the quality characteristics are the same. So some of the you know most uh, I guess some of the studies out there would say like it's seven, eight, nine percent, ten, twelve even. And that's a far away from the ninety-eight. Let's say we're gonna uh, buy. So what does that mean? Uh, I know this is recorded, but the idea is that we're collectively hypocrites when it comes to these issues, right? Now, of course, I'm going to take you to the, 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 the other kind of key question, which is whose responsibility really is it, though? Because let's forget about sustainability for a second. When IBM produced the first personal computer, okay, how big was the CPU, you think? It was about the size of this room. Okay. Now, IBM didn't go out there and say, you consumer, you know what? If you buy my computer, you're going to be so much more efficient and so much more productive. So when you build your home, make sure you build an extra room in order to buy my computer. That would be absurd. But when it comes to sustainability, right? What do we say? You consumer, go educate yourself about all the negative, you should know your carbon emissions. Sorry, no personal. But <laughs> yeah, you should know your carbon emissions and you should pay for it. And, and it's, it's bad on you that you don't know it. For me, that sounds in many ways in a deflection of responsibility from the business towards the customers. Like, oh, if the customers don't want it, I'll never do it, right? Um, good to keep in mind. But what that tells me though is that um, how responsible you're going to be across your stakeholders, it's a matter of choice. And if it's a choice, it's a strategic choice. And that's why I think it's so, this question is so key for management going forward. Because you can start simple. You can say, I'll just comply. Rules and regulations, I'll just follow them. Some companies, you know, in recent years, you know, think about account openings in Wells Fargo, think about almost diesel, almost clean diesel engines at VW and so on, right? Um, they're on the, let's say, less than compliance gray zone. Um, 
But then again, there's other companies that say, well, I'm going to do an environmental management system, a water management system. I'm going to do some, create some efficiencies out of the, uh, out of these initiatives without necessarily, you know, putting my head out, like um, sticking my head out, like Paul Polman would do, and say, you know, I'll become an industry leader. But that means that this is a choice. And the question is, how do I make this choice? How do I understand who my key um, stakeholders are and make those investments and actually see them as investments in, st in terms of costs? Think about employees, for example. You have a choice. You can be Walmart and pay minimum wage. It's compliance. It's legal. But you would never expect human capital to be a strategic factor if you pay human capital minimum wage, right? Other, comp other companies may, may say, well, you know what, I'm going to pay market forces, right? Whatever the market salary is. Why? Because human capital is important for me. Consulting companies, human capital is very important, right? I'm going to pay uh, more, but that's because human capital is very important for my business model. Higher investment, but higher strategic value of human capital. Then you have companies that operate in places like Bangladesh, India, China, and they say, what market forces? Right? There's an abundance of unskilled labor. If I pay market forces, these people, although I'm going to pay them, they might not afford to eat or health care or send their kids to school. So I have a moral obligation to pay a living wage. Right? Again, even higher investment in that context. But also when you do pay a living wage, you might uh, you know, uh, have better engagement. The less recruitment costs down the, the line for employees because they, they have higher retention. Right? More loyalty by your employees. And then there's companies that will bring this stakeholder, the employees, at the center of what we, they do. Have you heard about this company called HCL Technologies? What are they known for? They have this wonderful book out right, that says, Employees First, Customers Second. That's the name of the book. They're doing very well. Right? They didn't take it from her cabinet. Sorry, the what? They took it from her cabinet. Oh, they did? <laughs> so, it, it, it matters who my material stakeholder is and to what extent do I make investments in that stakeholder um, and to what extent that stakeholder in particular is at the center of what we do, uh, as, as, at, this, at the center of the business model, essentially. Now, you can see, though, that if this is a strategic choice, how responsible I am, right, that creates a, an even more interesting question, which basically is, does it pay to be responsible? Does it pay off in the long run to be responsible? And that is a very, very, very difficult question to answer, right? Because we, we have the, the, the well-known issue of correlation versus causation. Is it sustainability that's going, or responsibility that's going to cause higher performance? Or is it the case that companies that are doing well anyway can afford to be responsible or sustainable? The direction of causality is very important, right? But that's why you see so many PhDs being written on this issue, right? But I want to highlight one thing, and, and this is a, a good critique, and you should always ask this question about, is this causal or is this just correlation? Because if it's correlation, it doesn't make sense to go do it, right? It's not going to lead to increased performance. But think about, forget about sustainability for a second, right? Let's talk about another difficult question. Does advertising lead to more sales? If I show you a high correlation between advertising and sales, you can say, well, it might be the case that more advertising means more sales, but it might also mean that companies that have, for whatever reason, higher sales can afford more marketing. Is it causal or correlational? So I think you should always ask that question, or other people to, ah, oh, if you are an organization that learns, right? So organizational learning leads to better performance. You must have heard that one, right? The question is, well, yeah, that's one direction of causality, but it might be the case that companies that are doing well can afford the time, you know, to send their employees to training and human development and so on. It doesn't go from the learning to the performance. It's because you perform well that your employees have time to go learn. So this question is a very important one. It's one that has, in, in many ways, uh, tortured this field of sustainability because every time you show data about 
um, sustainability leading to performance, people will tell you, well, yeah, but is that causal or is it correlation? Is it the fact that they were, that they were responsible that led to profitability? And the, the, another way of framing the question is, am I profitable despite being responsible or am I profitable because I am responsible? And those are two different questions, right? Now, the fact that in recent years we have more and more of this ESG data or sustainability data, plus theoretically we started understanding what is it that we talk about when we talk about responsibility, plus the fact that there are, even our econometric methods have improved in the meantime, allow us to say, and this is the state of the art if you like, that the link between sustainability and profit is not only positive, it's also causal. Right? And offline, if any of you wants to have a crash quick chat on econometrics over a lot of coffee, uh, <laughs> we, we can do that. Right? But the idea is that with all those PhDs being written, data being analyzed, methods being applied, theories being applied, and so on, we can say that there's a positive causal link. And I'll give you another uh, uh, example. This is from a study that uh, I did with two of my co-authors where we monitored these two groups of companies. One that had committed to what we call ESG policies in the early 1990s and, and a group of companies that did not. And you can see that over an almost two year um, horizon, the, 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 the companies that had this commitment significantly outperformed the others. This is only one measure, by the way, stock returns. And again, I'll be glad to share the actual paper with you with this glorious econometric detail, but basically, any measure of performance you take, whether it's operational, whether it's stock market based and so on, shows you that they do better. Now that's all good and fine, okay? That's almost an academic question to ask. Question is, okay, I'm going to work on Monday morning, right? Even if I have the best of intentions and I want to implement this in my business, okay? Um, how do I do it? Why is it that sustainability pays? What are the mechanisms through which my responsibility commitments translates into profit? And then on top of that, of course, is after I understand the mechanism, mechanisms, how do I build an organization that allows this to happen? Because it's all good and fine to say, you know, oh, if you're more responsible towards your employees, you have better employee engagement. But that's housed within an organization that gives incentives, that has a board. Right? That, gen that, that uses some metrics in order to incentivize. So how do I build that house of responsibility, if you like, to allow some of these pathways between responsibility and profit to materialize? So the state of research today has identified a number of these factors. I'll walk you through um, a couple of them, but basically um, it's multifaceted. In different industries, it's going to be uh, different factors are going to be material. But we do know, for instance, we know that companies that are more responsible gain better access to finance. This is one that I'm going to go in detail, uh, go in in detail in the next couple of slides. We also know that companies that commit to, to responsibility are more innovative. Now, why would that be the case? Go, that's the second thing I'm going to go into uh, in detail. But we also have other reasons. Social license to operate. For instance, mining companies that submit a bid to governments that also includes, for instance, a plan on how, it, on, on how they're going to build a sustainable local economy after they leave the mine are much more likely to win contracts because they care about the communities in which they're going to operate. Employee engagement and retention, a better alignment, if you like, between purpose and, and why do employees work for a particular company, how they are motivated, incentivized, inspired in working in this organization means that uh, true commitment towards your employees will actually not only retain the ones that you have, but allow you to recruit better talent. Think about all these companies that um, actually implement innovative circular economy model, uh, business models. You know what they are facing? They're facing lines of brand new engineers and designers, bright young kids that just graduated and they want to work for them because they feel they have an impact and a positive impact through their work. Okay, so recruitment of, of, of talent and better talent is another way that allows you to, um, uh, to see the link between being responsible and being more profitable. Clearly, you know, you, you, if you are at the forefront of environmental uh, uh, credentials, you might not have to worry about upcoming regulation. You build more long-term relationships and there's also the customer side in which, uh, um, according to which, you might build more brand loyalty 
um, by at least that portion of consumers that actually cares about deeply about these environmental and social challenges. But a couple of things to highlight here. In some industries, human capital is going to be important. Therefore, the employee pathway is going to be perhaps more important than finance. In other industries, though, financial capital might be more limited and therefore preferential access to capital might give you, will give you an advantage compared to firms that have less of access, uh, uh, lower access to, to finance. All right. Now, this is the, the art part of management where depending on your industry and your context, you need to ponder and think about who are my material stakeholders? Is it the environment? Is it my employees? And to what extent am I willing to make this investment? To what extent do I think that these mechaniz mechanisms are going to materialize? Now, this is the kind of thing that I think it's, it's on the minds of a lot of executives because they face these pressures and they're trying to make sense. Right? What, do, what do I mean by preferential access to finance? What do I mean by innovation? Why? And this is where we increasingly, with all the studies and the data that we accumulate, we know a lot. And let me give you an example, uh, two examples to walk you through to see how detailed we know and therefore how, how much detail we really understand these links, um, far beyond just saying, oh, profitability pays off. That's all good and fine, but it might not be as useful. Right? Let's take the first one, better access to finance. Consider this example. Has anyone heard about this uh, agreement between Philips and ING before? So, ING decided to, they, signed, they gave a loan to Philips of $1 billion. It's not a small loan, right? Um, but it was the first of its kind because the agreement said that the interest rate that ING was going to charge Philips will rise and fall with Philips sustainability rating. You know all these ratings and ranking and environmental, social and governance issues? This guy said, if you're more responsible business, your interest rate is going to fall. And I'm going to have a third party, in this case, Sustainalytics, that's going to accumulate information, rate and rank you every year. And essentially, the more responsible you are, the more preferential access you're going to have to, cap to capital. But this is not the only thing, right? If you think about other uh, things we, we just discussed at the beginning, you know, um, the CEO of the world's uh, largest asset manager, uh, BlackRock, said the same thing. If you're, if you're only financially uh, successful, that's not going to be enough for us as investors. Morningstar, sustainability ratings. Even here in London, a number of investors put a lot of money into developing AI algorithms in order to understand what this sustainability data actually means and integrate them perhaps more effectively than others into their investment decisions. Okay? And of course, after the world's largest uh, asset owner did this, uh, a lot of others followed, including, including State Street, uh, which is the second largest asset uh, manager in the world, Vanguard, and so on. Preferential access to finance. Now, you wonder now, why would uh, ING give better rates to Philips if they're more responsible? Can we go even more micro? Can we really understand why would they do this? Is it a moral thing, right? Because they want to, um, you know, uh, promote more uh, responsible companies, right? I mean, there are companies at the end of the day, right? They're not uh, foundations or philanthropic uh, organizations. So what we know from the research, though, is as follows. If you are a more responsible company, what does that mean? It means, first, you're more transparent as a company. You give, in this case, the market more information. What does that mean? They're better able to evaluate your risk, more accurately able to evaluate your risk. And it works both ways, right? That's why you see a number of companies, sorry, a number of banks withdrawing from funding uh, uh, coal, a new, a new dirty coal factories, for example. Why? They're more risky. It's as simple as that. But all, the, the reverse side of that is that if you're more responsible and you're more transparent, that allows the bank or the financier to value your risks better. But it's not just about the valuation of the risk. If you're a more responsible company, you're going to have better stakeholder engagement, more stable relationships with your suppliers, your employees, your customers, and so on. What does that mean for the market? It means that there's lower information asymmetry between you and the company, but also there's less agency costs. In other words, the better contracting if, you have, if, if your contracting is based on um, um, better long-term relationships. And that gives you the outcome. More information in more stable companies, of course I'm going to fund them better. It follows. Right? 
So that's the level of detail that we know about the, all these mechanisms of sustainability. Um, and, and when we speak with executives and we teach executives, you can go down and say, well, how does that apply to your company? Is this a, part, a material factor? Can you become more transparent? Can you build more engagement in what you do? Now, my, one of my favorite ones, of course, is innovation. Look at how many uh, uh, things I could find from the press. Why sustainability is now the key driver of innovation? Five stages of achieving innovation through sustainability. How sustainability leadership drives innovation. So here's a question to you. If a company is more responsible, right? why would it be more innovative? Compared to a company that says, I just want to be more innovative. I mean, I told you the transparency mechanism before about the access to finance. Can you think of anything of why would a responsible company be more likely to innovate? Why? What would Maybe because it creates one yeah. more constraints and, and forces you to get out of the either or, and then you have to yeah. get creative to do that. Exactly. So one way, reason is the mother of all innovation is bottlenecks, the problems that you're going to look for a solution to. Now, if you don't care about the environment, then you're not imposing that constraint, as you mentioned, and then that's not the problem of looking for a solution. So nothing is going to force you to actually think, and indeed, when you have environmental and social challenges, right, you're going to think outside your comfort zone, outside the space upon you you're searching. It's going to be broader, wider, compared to the traditional space. Right? Any other reasons? I think it also encourages um, collaboration. Yeah. Because where I currently, where I currently work, yeah. they're actually asking uh, big suppliers to think of creative ways yeah. to encourage circular economy and think of how we can recycle uh, products and, right, right. and think of the long-term use. Right, so if you have essentially these better relationships, right, you're going to get not only different constraints, but different inputs. You're going to get maybe better, more accurate, more timely input from your supply chain, from your employees. Right? from your customers, from your local communities that oftentimes no solutions to the problems, it's just that you never spoke to them in order to find out, all right? Now think about the innovation, sorry sir, yes, go ahead. That one of the issues in sustainability is the fact that it's a design problem as well. Yes. So because of that, if you then have a sort of a, a view towards sustainability, right. you would then sort of increase innovation. Right, precisely. It's, it's a guided, in a sense, design, right? Um, now, th let's think about the innovation process. What are the other elements of an innovation process in an organization? Think about your own organizations. When you want to uh, spark innovation, what are other key elements of that process, necessary elements of an innovation process within organizations? Getting other people to follow you. Right, so selling the, the vision, the target, the mission. Right? And how do you, I mean, when you say follow you, what do you expect them to do exactly in order to innovate? Be inspired. Be inspired to do what? Take risks. Take risks. Experiment. Try stuff. Experiment. Try things out. But you know what the problem with that is, right? So many organizations out there say, oh, in this organization we encourage failure because our employees learn from failure. And then when you're an employee and you fail, what happens? <laughs> yes, where else might You get fired. But... But how could you be innovative if, if, you, if, if, the, if the failure is such an integral part of the innovation process and you declare that sometimes and then what happens, you fire the employees? But isn't that why some organizations have innovation labs in-house? Right. To encourage that kind of containment of that? Right, exactly. Contain, exactly. But, but make comparison, imagine if you are in an organization that when it says, I am responsible and, and genuine towards my employees, and when I do say that they will learn from failure, I'm not going to fire them, what are you going to get? More experimentation. More experimentation over a larger domain when I see environmental and social constraints. And on top of that, if I'm an organization that's responsible, it's, uh, chances are I'm going to be more long-term. So I'm not going to be uh, a company that says, ah, I want clean diesel engines and I want them tomorrow. I mean, you can say that, but you know, you'll get what you ask for sometimes, right? So a longer term time horizon, better stakeholder engagement, a, a tolerance, if you like, of failure, and responsibility as employees, what does that mean? It means higher employee uh, productivity, right? Higher employee engagement, higher employee creativity. So when you put those three things together, right, a more secure work environment, better engagement with employees, you focus on the long term, you allow them to experiment, 
they're more productive. They experiment more. They try stuff out. And if that's the case, the data shows that those companies are not only producing more patents, but they also produce more highly cited patents, which means it's better quality innovation, right? So again, going down to the, uh, starting from the big questions, sustainability and profits, going down to the mechanisms, but also going within the mechanisms to really understand on the day-to-day -day operations of the business. What does that mean? How does that, um, how does that translate? Now, I have a concern though about yeah. innovation as a broad subject. Yeah. Because we certainly have um, innovation centers globally. Mm. Predominantly, the conversation about innovation is around product development. Yeah. And yet, actually, we then also educate the, the, uh, the company about the three to four different types of innovation that it can be in yeah. every day. So I think there's a, there is sometimes almost a rational obsession with the process of innovation. Right. Which actually, I think, sometimes turns off. Buzz in an right. Well, I think, in my humble opinion, that's exactly, it's like your colleague was saying earlier, the idea of responsibility and sustainability gives that mission, the goal, the objective, the inspirational end. Not innovation in and of itself as a target, but you give the inspirational, it's like John Kennedy that gave the, uh, uh, that told the American people, you know, uh, by the end of the decade, we're going to put the man on the moon. That was the target, that was the goal. Right? That was the big, hairy, audacious goal, if you like. Right? And then innovation, it, it was a very nice byproduct. Why? Because people, and that's the, I think that's, that's at the core of leadership, because people believed the goal, but what did they doubt? What did they question? The way to get there. Right? I, I would also extend my concerns into responsible organization and sense mm. of sustainability. Yeah. Because I think the very writing of the corporate sustainability report is often done outside of those areas that would normally be involved in it. Yeah. And I mean, I was, I was an auditor when we were going for SAP to FRS in yeah, yeah, yeah. the back of you know, yeah. all of the, the Sarbanes-Oxley kind of the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the first operational reviews being written. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a paragraph attached to the audit. Right. We've got entire books, glossily, awards for them. I was going to say, and yeah. I, and I, from an auditing perspective, parking my, you know, last decade in HR, <clears> have we lost the reason we're doing that? Right. Which is actually... Yeah. Are we actually competing for the awards for our glossy? Yes, books? exactly. Or we have anybody who's involved in it writing. Yep, yep, yep. Corporate PR people doing exactly, or even marketing companies from the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. HR function. I don't. Know, it would be very interesting for me to see how many of us start with our corporate responsibility report and then work our HR strategy from that, or whether we all start thinking in every function, what's our strategy this year, and we don't refer to that. So exactly. Again, I just, I, just, I, I worry a little bit as we educate into more of these subjects and gain more data and yes. more, you know, tweets or whatever, etc. I think sometimes yep. it's actually becoming bureaucratic in, uh, it's, in itself. Absolutely, and and it feels less genuine, right? If that report is digging, is written, for instance, I mean. If, combining your two roles, right? <laughs> if that's written by the marketing or an external marketing team, and for instance, the employees know nothing about it. They never read the employee report. I mean, I have worked with companies in the C-suite when I ask how many of you have read the, the sustainability report of your own company. And I often ask that to companies that don't have a sustainability report and they still say yes <laughs> sometimes. So, <laughs> which brings you to the, the, what I would like to say next, which is how genuine this is, how embedded this is. Because for me, what you just described, that's not, genuine commitment, that's mostly greenwashing, right? So if we are going to allow this, these mechanisms to materialize, what kind of an organization do we build? And where does disclosure come in? And that's what we also know a lot about. So when we talk about embedding this into the DNA, we know now that there are at least four fundamental pillars of the organization through which executives can truly integrate. And these four factors is what distinguishes, remember the graph I showed you before with the outperformance in the long run? This is what distinguishes this, what we call the house of sustainability, an organizational structure that's going to allow you to materialize those factors we talked about before, the better access to finance, the employee engagement, innovation, and so on. So in the last remaining minutes, allow me to quickly go through these factors to tell you exactly what I mean, because none of them is good on its own. Right? The genuine commitment to responsibility is not a la carte. It's not that you can do one sustainability report and you're done. Or you have one incentive and you're done. It has to be structural, it has to be embedded, and it has to touch upon these four pillars of the organization. So let me start with the uh, first one. Corporate governance. What does that mean? It has to start 
at the top. It has to be embedded at the top. What do we mean by that? It has to be um, sustainability should be a f or responsibility should be a formal board level responsibility. You need to have board level oversight and you need to have a subcommittee whose responsibility is to deal with issues of sustainability and responsibility. Not only that, what is one of the most powerful things that we use in organization to get the behavior that we want? Incentives. You cannot possibly say, I care about my stakeholders, I care about the environment, I care about my employees, and you incentivize everyone on profit or sales alone. What we found is that you need to uh, incentivize the behaviors that you want to get. If you want to get responsible behaviors, which means that you care about all of your stakeholders, you need to incentivize on financials as well as non-financials in a balanced way, depending on who you judge to be your material stakeholders. So if you don't get that, that's what I meant before when I said at the fundamentals of the organization. And that's why you see this, right? A lot of companies incentivize on reduction in carbon emissions, for instance, uh, in, within their industries, in addition to the financial uh, that, uh, that they give to their, um, to their executives and to their employees, right? They become KPIs, essentially, in the same way that the financial KPIs are, because then you get the commitment, then you get the, the behavior. Second, stakeholder engagement. When traditional organizations have a labor issue or a problem with the local community, how do they resolve those issues? They resolve them ad hoc, as they arise. Why? Because we think, you know, we report to the shareholders, the ultimate supreme being that cares about profitability, and the rest of the issues will deal how, in, in the way they arise. Now, if you're a responsible organization, though, and you do understand that you have your responsibility across a range of stakeholders, you're going to invest in those relationships. You're going to invest in those structures. You're going to have process in place. Organizations that, for instance, train their managers on how to engage. They have processes on how they sit down with their stakeholder and they come up with the opportunities, the targets, the goals of the engagement. They publicly report a process for publicly reporting on um, to the stakeholder, to the public, and to the board of what was the result of this commitment. In other words, it's much more structural, it's deeper, and it's more meaningful. It's not just about, as you said before, what I'm going to write in the report. It's, like, it's about the report should just, if it's genuine, should reflect structures that I have in the organization, pillars. Um, another one, short-term versus long-term, right? Um, how can we detect this? Well, for instance, how do you speak to your investment analysts? When nobody, when, when, you know, it's not your public uh, glossy paper, but it's actually the call to the analyst when you really talk business. Do you speak more about financials or non-financials or you have a better balance? Do you speak about short term or long term or do you have a better balance? Let's look at your investor base. Investors are not all the same. Some of them uh, trade much more often and they're transient. Some of them hold for the long term. Can we go in and see, you know, who were you able to convince? Because if you are truly long-term, we would expect to see a higher proportion of long-term investors in your stock, right? That would reinforce your strategy to be more long-term, right? Finally, how transparent, you see, this is where sustainability comes in. But even within the reports, there's smart ways of looking about commitment. I'll give you an example, and probably you know this from your auditing days. There's no standards, right? No reporting standards, no auditing standards. So companies pretty much can write whatever they want in these reports. But still, you can see differences. For example, the companies that are less committed to responsibility, they're going to tell you about the carbon emissions of their offices in London. They're not going to tell you anything about how their factories in India and China are behaving. But the responsible companies, and these are the statistically significant differences that we find, are much more likely to report on their global activities. Inter even in their sustainability reports. When you, do the, the, when you take the Bloomberg uh, uh, quality, uh, the quality scores on these disclosures, they're typically higher. And they better do, because if I'm going to incentivize my employees on these numbers, I better make sure that I'm gathering these numbers accurately, right? So they are convincing to my employees and actually makes sense as part of an incentive scheme. They cannot be fluffy numbers, right? So you can see how these four pillars together form what we would call this um, foundation, if you like, the four pillars of, of responsibility. And it's the same with accountability, right? Am I more likely as a company to employ, for, to, to use, for example, um, human rights standards in my selection of suppliers, to, uh, to, uh, to use environmental health and safety laws and regulations in my selection of suppliers, 
for example. In other words, do I diffuse that accountability throughout my supply chain as opposed to just the, the, the boundaries of my firm? So what we know uh, is that these are four distinguishing factors that allow us to uh, detect that genuine commitment. It's not going to come from the sustainability report alone at all. But it's like every investment. You really need to go deep into the organization. But the argument here is that if you really commit to, sustain, to responsibility, maybe sustainability towards the environment or your employees or your local communities, first, you build the house, essentially. That would allow this to happen. Culturally, right? Because you can see if you have the, this kind of incentives, if your board is looking in that direction, if you're training your managers in stakeholder management and so on, you're building a culture of responsibility, right? And not this amorphous culture, but something that can actually translate into specific pillars. So we're running out of time. Just to summarize very quickly, what we did try to do in the one hour today is basically as follows. We started with the idea that companies are faced with these increased demands, pressures, and expectations to be more responsible. We know that for those companies that are truly committed, in the long run, this may pay off. But clearly, it's not enough to just say it it's, it's, it's pays off. The question is, how does it pay off? And there's multiple ways, and we discussed briefly the idea of better access to finance and more innovative outcomes. And again, research is ongoing. We're discovering more and more ways, but also going deeper into them. But that's not just about the ways. It's also about building the house of responsibility, the, setting the foundation for an organization that can materialize these mechanisms. And there we talked about these four pillars that we know constitute uh, a responsible organization. It's not a la carte, it's not in the marketing, it's a complicated issue, but as I told you uh, at the beginning of this, on this, of, of this hour, I do think is perhaps one of the biggest mega trends, as you can see, even from recent events this week, is going to, only going to become uh, greater uh, expectations and demands on organizations and a huge challenge for management going forward. So with that, Thank you very much. Any, I'll be <laughs> sticking around. Any questions or concerns or comments or reactions, by all means, feel free to, uh, to get in touch. Um, this is my favorite uh, uh, cartoon to finish with. You know, sometimes people, people, why do you care? Why do you do all these things? Like, well, if it's, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. So enjoy the rest of your uh, conference, and please do stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.